uh, you know, uh, somebody else is forty and she had uh, eight girls in this room. We were in the same class. Wow. And I stood up at the first conference and Ms. Corey and Clyde was there and whatever. And the team was one of the only players. Yeah, I believe it. Okay, everybody, I want to get us started on our um, ninth annual unsession. Um, uh, let's see. Alexis, could you go in the hall and tell everybody that we're starting? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> um, so the, for, how many of you have been here before when we've done this? Okay, there's a few of you. If you haven't gone into the bit.ly yet, it's right there on the screen, bit.ly slash unsession2018. You can do this as live as we're talking here. We have a number of people who have signed up um, already, and I'm going to go first. Uh, but the whole, um, you know, um, the way we do it, you're going to have three minutes to do a little mini presentation. You can uh, show or demo or talk about any um, innovation of your own, a best practice, a tool, an idea, something cool that's going on on your campus. SUNY and non-SUNY people are welcome to participate. So Sherry, you could show something cool. <laughs> Um, so just go to the bit.ly, put your name, your institution, and a couple of links. You could do your Padlet. You could show your Padlet. Um, and, um, and then um, we'll have a timekeeper. Is Willow in the room? Willow, you want to do our timing? Three minutes per person. <laughs> All right. Um, so um, I'm going to get us started to talk about uh, some of the free, um, openly licensed resources that um, Open SUNY Online Teaching has available uh, and that you may or may not be aware of. And I've been trying to put some energy into um, communicating out some of these um, really cool resources that we have. Um, but I would love your help in disseminating information about them on your campus uh, just to make sure that people are aware that these tools are um, available, that they exist, that they are openly licensed, that they are free to use and adapt in any way you would like. So the tools, um, the resources that I have uh, to show you, the links are all here on the, um, on the Google Docs. And the first one is the Interested in Online, uh, in Teaching Online resource. And this is a, um, a, a resource intended for anyone who's interested in learning more about online teaching. Um, it is a, a self-paced uh, resource that you can engage in in two ways. There's a mapped out journey, so there's a step-by-step -step sort of path to go through the content. And then there's a meandering way where you can just use it like a website and, and browse any of the materials that are here. Each There are three modules of content and a readiness inventory. And so this could be for prospective online faculty. It could be for librarians, technologists, new instructional designers, faculty developers, uh, deans and departments 
department chairs who supervise online teaching and learning um, faculty to really get a baseline, a fundamental foundation of understanding about online teaching and learning. Um, and, and as I said, there's three modules. It starts with a module overview. There are a number of content um, pieces. And the, all the modules are set up the same way. And then each ends with a little mini quiz. There are optional conversations available for people if they want to engage in conversation with others who are interested and mentor type people who have volunteered to interact with folks who are interested. And then there's also a badge. After you complete all of the activities, you can collect a badge. The readiness inventory I mentioned is also a part of this. And there are a number of checklists. You can observe a course, see video listen to faculty, listen to students, and uh, this is really an amazing resource for instructional designers to help pre-check their online faculty before having them engage in any faculty development. So this is checking the baseline technical skills to, to, um, to develop an online course. Um, we created as a part of that course the 10 common myths about teaching online, so I want to make sure that you had that in your, in your toolkit. We also have video videos um, about, uh, we've, we've videotaped the online teaching ambassadors over the last three years to talk about why they love online teaching um, as a voice of a peer to other faculty so that faculty can hear from faculty about what the benefits and um, um, are in, in their view about teaching online. So I, I wanted to point you to that. And then the video playlists, and you'll find all of these videos in the open... Okay, <laughs> I'm almost done. Um, and so these video assets are here, and I invite you to come and look at these collections of videos. You all are represented in there, and if you've been videotaped, your video is here somewhere. So um, I just want to encourage you to take a look, to use these in your own faculty development activities, share them with your faculty and colleagues, and, um, and then let us know how you're using them. Okay, it's my time. <laughs> um, so the next person up, so all those links are here on this um, on this on session page. The next person up is John Locke. John, where are you? I'm here. here you are. All right. <laughs> okay, go. All right. Um, so I've been teaching online for years and exclusively for about the last four years until last semester when I was offered a face-to-face -face class in public speaking and I jumped at the opportunity. I, I love de being in front of a class. So normally I spend time with faculty explaining to them how they're going to convert their face-to-face -face classes to an online setting. And I had this little experiment where I was doing exactly the opposite. I was trying to figure out how to use the online techniques that I use in a face-to-face -face class to make things more efficient, more practical, more engaging for students. And uh, the one thing I realized, I don't know how many here have taken or taught a public speaking course, but there's a lot of peer review involved. And uh, that has to happen <clears throat> normally. Most textbooks have like a, a, a evaluation form. Students are supposed to photocopy it out of the book and fill it out after each student gets up to give, give a speech. Well, if you have 25 students in your class and you have four uh, high stakes evaluated speeches within your term, that's what, I, I had the number in my head before, it's 2,500 sheets of paper, five reams of paper. Okay, and I went out to the uh, to the um, Sierra Club website the other day and figured out that that equals about a third to a half of an average tree. Okay, so in an online setting, we don't care about trees; we don't use them mostly. But in a classroom, it's a big deal, and I didn't want to have to handle, shuffle, read, or anything else, 2,500 sheets of paper. So we're a Moodle school, and there's a, a, um, an, act, an activity in there called the database, but it works pretty much like a Google form. So I, f I created a, a form based on that, uh, that um, evaluation sheet in the textbooks, a lot of Likert, Likert scale stuff, and then a couple places for comments. Students would fill it out. I, first night of class, just to make sure that, uh, that everybody could do this, I asked you know, students if they all had some sort of a device, a phone, a, a laptop, a tablet. They all did. So I said, good. If they didn't, I was going to find some loners. <clears throat> but anyway, 
So when these speeches came up, it took about two minutes between each speech, which was just enough time for students to go in there, hit the drop-down menu, pick the student, and then fill out this form before the next uh, speech would begin. The way I set up the, the uh, back-end database was students didn't have access to it, and I did that so that I could go in and make sure that students were being kind. I wanted them to be uh, critical but, but kind at the same time. They were. Thank God. But if they weren't, I would have been able to, you know, extract or, or redact those statements. I sorted the database by student, copied and pasted all the, the, the responses they got into a separate spreadsheet and emailed, them, emailed that back to them. If I were better at, uh, at creating uh, charts, and bar graphs, and that sort of thing, it could have been really cool. But uh, as it was, the students, after the second one, the students came to me and said, how soon am I going to get my feedback? And I'd say, over the weekend, you know. But ultimately, I think it was a success. And uh, the next time I do it, I'm going to begin to, I'll tell you next time I get up, because my time is out. I am here to speak on behalf of FACT2 about an incredible event that's going to happen in May. Many of you attend called uh, CIT. And let's see if this link will open up. Come on. Here we go. <coughs> I'll be here while I talk. <coughs> So just to get the link up, yeah. So anyway, um, the FACT2 Council, along with many volunteers, uh, and see that lady walking down the hall there, Nancy Motondo? Okay, this would not happen without Nancy Motondo. I don't know how she does it, but I think they need to have an armed guard on her on the way to and from work just to make sure she makes it because she really holds up the whole thing with the help of many volunteers that should be acknowledged as well. So let me tell you that our speaker is the Muhammad Ali of MOOCs, Barbara Oakley. And she is not only going to come and speak about her practice, she's going to do a reading from her book MindShift and she's also going to do a preview reading of a new book that's coming out in August. But that's not all. She's also going to be conducting a workshop. So after the keynote, participants who sign up early will be able to attend a workshop where it'll be hands-on learning how to make an engaging video a la Oakley. And she's an incredible person. She plans on attending the whole conference. So next. We also have VR events, and we have a sponsor, right, Nancy, that's providing Google Cardboard for the attendees? Oh, it's still work. I thought it was done. All right, sorry. It will happen, though. We're holding at least one, if not two, group participation VR events. They're going to be expeditions, uh, as we're calling them. And we have some other incredible speakers. So. I urge you to come and to also bring your colleagues. This is going to be a very special um, event in Cortland, New York. How much time is left? We have 30 seconds. 30 seconds? Okay. Well, I don't need it. I yield to the next person. I want people to know I didn't use all my time. opportunities and some resources in case you weren't aware of them, but I want to piggyback on what um, Jeffrey has shared and let you know that um, the Open SUNY community area is um, producing monthly sneak peeks for CIT, and these are a way for us to highlight and showcase some of the great things that you can experience at that conference. Hi, Kevin. <laughs> um, okay. 
So there's a link there for you to be able to go and get the sneak peek. Apparently, Kevin can't access it. I don't know why it was asking me to sign it. Um, so the, the one that we published last month features Barbara Oakley, uh, of course, and then um, the next one that will come out probably next week will have the conference registration in it so that um, you can get really excited that that's coming. The other thing that we have here are the fellow chats. If you haven't participated in a fellow chat, I would encourage you to check out the website. We have um, several seasons posted there for you, and the fellow chat program really is to showcase the work that our faculty are doing across our campuses. And so if you have or know someone who uh, is, is doing something that you think would other people would be interested in, we would love for you to have them submit a proposal for this season. Teresa just did one uh, in February, and hers is there on the website. And you can see others here. You just click on the title, and it opens up the, the chat. The other thing that's here that's really um, kind of nice is something called a chat recap. And these documents contain the description, a bio of the speaker, and they also have links to the slides and the recordings. So uh, everything is contained in the chat recap. Those, um, the recordings are posted on our YouTube channel that Alex showed you, and there's actually a particular channel uh, playlist for fellow chats there. You can take a look at that. And then the SUNY OER Services Showcase webinars happen monthly. These, uh, <laughs> We are people in the um, These webinars are featured here on the um, SUNY OER registration page. And these also have a similar kind of idea with the chat recap documents. We call them encores for the showcase. So uh, any month that you pick, you can go to and you can get the chat, uh, or the chat, the showcase encore document there at the bottom. So the same site that you register on is the same site you can go to to get all the resources after the fact. Again, slides, recording, and YouTube, all of that. Okay. So those happen monthly also. And then lastly, of course, we have the online teaching hub, which we've had for a while, but I would encourage all of you to consider being a guest author for our blog on there. The most recent one is posted there. That was from Jeremy Tiermini from Finger Lakes. Um, he is one of our past ambassadors, and Jeremy submitted a blog post on his experience in teaching. And so if you can look over some of those, if you have somebody that you'd love to recommend, I would encourage you to email me about that so I can get connected and personally invite them. Okay, am I good? Uh, 10 over? You let me go over. I'm so so privileged. Robin is next. Hi, everybody. I'm Robin Sullivan. I'm an online learning specialist at UB, and I'm going to talk to you about the new SUNY Exploring Technologies for Lifelong Learning and Success EM Tech MOOC. And I put the notes that I'm going to try to speak from right into the document so that you can uh, get a refresher or do the elevator speech for anybody that um, is not here and you want to share the information with them. I also gave you some cards to take back to your campus. But um, uh, MTech MOOC is an open access resource. It is targeted to the needs of all learners, including faculty, staff, and students. Um, it is, the goal is to identify the value and implications of using technology tools for personal growth and um, personal and professional growth and to support lifelong learning. The um, idea is to keep pace with technology change. This project is um, based on SUNY TOPE, which many of you may already be aware of. Um, TOPE had a five-year history as SUNY-wide faculty professional development, and thank you to half or more of this room who has helped to bring that project forward to create this resource. Um, EM Tech consists of two parts. So there is the MOOC available in Coursera, and also, the, um, there is an EM Tech Wiki. So when you click on the URL, it will take you to a wiki, which is tried to uh, alleviate one of the issues in tools of engagement of keeping the resources sustainable. So now it will be a crowdsourced library, a socially curated discovery engine to find the emerging technology tools that meet your objectives. 
So whatever it is, whatever module you're in in the MOOC, if you're trying to learn about communication, collaboration, creativity, you go to that module, you then select the objective. What are you trying to do? Raise awareness. And from there, you're directed down to the tools. The general public is able to keep that sustainable, and we're going to be submitting a new IITG to try to apply that same kind of database-driven back end to two other successful SUNY MOOCs, and I've had a couple conversations here of others who might say, oh, yeah, that seems to fit well with my needs. Um, so it's open access, of course, like all things we do, and able to be shared. Um, and what else do I want to say? Um, there, it, the MOOC is five weeks long, covers the four C's of a 21st century learner. Um, I think I mentioned those already. It, mar it launches on March 12th, but then each month after that, there will be a new cohort in Coursera, if you're familiar with how that works. Um, you just uh, enroll in the first session. If you don't finish, that doesn't mean you've failed the course. You go and you join the second uh, next version until you do get to finish and get your badges and certificate. And <laughs> So we've been hearing a lot uh, the last couple of days about good research that's going on in online teaching. Uh, Tanya's presentation this morning, Peter's yesterday. And uh, one of the things that I struggle with and what, what I know many teachers struggle with is how to make sense of it, how to apply it to your practice. So many of you are familiar with the scholarship of teaching and learning uh, or action research where faculty actually look at their own courses as objects of research or opportunities to do research. Uh, it's a, Tough thing to sort of get started in, but those faculty who do that uh, are able to kind of think about their courses and change their courses in ways that other faculty who don't do that aren't able to do that. So what I've been trying to struggle to figure out a way to do that throughout the system, I struggled to do this on my own campus at Brockport when I was there, but I'd like to figure out a way to generate a sort of system-wide cohort of faculty who are doing scholarship of teaching and learning or action research in their courses. Um, this could be a regional thing. It could be a system-wide thing. Uh, it would differ a little bit from the Open SUNY Fellow <laughs> Program uh, in that it would be modality agnostic. So the type of research that faculty in this program would be doing could be for online courses, but it could be for face-to-face -face courses or hybrid courses or whatever. So uh, in the Google Doc, I put a link to a form. Uh, it's actually another Google Doc. Uh, and, and it basically outlines a proposal that I've been kicking around now for couple of years. Uh, and uh, also now there are spots to put your name and email address and ideas you have about this idea. Uh, we've, I've been going around the state the last few months talking to faculty development folks. And uh, whenever I bring this up, they're like, that's a great idea. We should do it. So really what we need to do is figure out to make it happen. Um, and like I said, I'm open to all ideas uh, and, and all comers. So if you're interested, sign up. Hello, I'm Karen Shirley Williams from the College at Brockport. Um, back in 2000, we deactivated a higher education mid-management master's degree. And it was a face-to-face -face weekend format that really appealed to adult students. Um, it was cohort-based, which can be easy to schedule for the administrators, but tough for students to be able to come in and out. And I thought that the mid-management title was rather uninspiring. Uh, slow forward to 2013-14, the college decided um, to look at bringing back and putting online master's degree programs in response to flagging um, master's enrollments because students now, when they're in graduate school, they want to accelerate, they want to go all year round, and a lot of our programs are still old school in terms of face-to-face, -face, and it's evenings, and they don't go in the winter and the summer, so it is not accelerated. And uh, the MS in higher education and management is one of the courses of uh, programs we decided to bring back. So to combine the best of both, we have made it a hybrid program. And the courses are uh, basically offered 90% online, 10% will be hybrid with weekend seminars, one per term. And they're one credit weekend seminars, Friday nights, Saturdays. And that, of course, gives students the face, -to -face contact with instructor as well as other students. So I am working on the program proposal that is going to be going to SUNY and State Ed. Um, 
and also the networking piece. As an LSD student working on my PhD at Syracuse University, long, slow distance, I took weekend classes and evening classes, and I understand the flexibility that adult working students need, and we feel that this program is going to do that. It is unique in the state in terms of the format, and so we're hoping this really provides access and success. Full-time students will be able to go um, 15 months to 18 months, and then part-time students will be able to stop in and stop out as adult students often need. So stay tuned and wish me luck. Hi, everybody. My name is Ronnie Lickman. I'm from SUNY Downstate. And I just want to take this opportunity to tell you about something very exciting that's happening That's happening at Downstate. Um, we have just developed, when I was looking at the impact handout yesterday, I noticed that there was one doctoral program that is distance. And we have just created a new doctoral program. It will be the first in New York State and the second in the nation. It's a doctorate of midwifery. We didn't just create it. We've been working on it for 11 years, and it was just approved by the Board of Trustees in November. So I'm bragging a little bit. Unfortunately, thank you all, unfortunately, because SUNY Downstate has not yet been approved to offer fully distance learning. We had to make it a hybrid. So I don't know if we'll appear in the impact book in the next few years because it is hybrid. I was a little disappointed to hear that you don't count that as distance. We thought about um, using this as the opportunity to get Downstate accredited to do this but I couldn't bear the thought of slowing it down by another three months, six months, two years, whatever. So maybe in the future, once SUNY Downstate is, a, is approved to offer fully distance, we will switch it to fully distance. But we're very, very excited about it. So thank you. I'm not talking yet. <laughs> Okay, so my name is Sherry Boyd, and I'm from North Lake College, and I'm going to introduce you to something that we teach faculty. I am a faculty um, mentor. I teach faculty. I'm a faculty member teaching faculty, and we teach them how to use technology in the classroom and online. And one of the things we use is we use something called a padlet wall, which is a, a, a type of board that you can put anything on. You can put video on it. You can put uh, your syllabus on it. You can put um, um, lectures on it. So what we use this for and what I use it for is for presentation. This is the padlet wall. You have the link to it. And what is on this Padlet wall are our program level outcomes w for my class because I wanted the faculty to see how we line up program level outcomes with class level outcomes with module level outcomes. But then how do we get them engaged? So we get our students to use Sign Up Genius so they can make appointments with faculty. It's online. If they sign up and you're an online student, then I use Zoom in order to meet with them for 15 minutes if they have questions. That makes me more accessible. The second thing I use this for is I use it for Remind. If you've ever heard of Remind, I want my students to be able to get messages from me. And I've put on this, if you want to look at Remind, it's free. And with Remind, you can uh, text your students in your class. It embeds in any um, LMS. And so they can choose to receive it by text on their phone, by email. And you don't have their information, and they don't have your information. And I set up a calendar that sends them reminders pretty much once a week, as well as being able to send the entire class messages if they don't want it at all with it embedded in the MLS, LMS, then it actually puts the announcements scrolling in your LMS if they don't want it. The other thing I use is I use Kahoot, which I use it in class, so when my students miss my class, if they say, what did I miss, I'm able to send them this quiz that the class took inside of, um, inside of their class. And the last thing I use is I use Flipgrid. 
Flipgrid is, I use that as a discussion. So instead of having them write everything, then they can use video in order to do that. So if I want you to introduce themselves, then they introduce themselves with video. It embeds into your LMS, as well as I want my students then to watch it, and then they have to answer at least two people in Flipgrid. Flipgrid is freemium. That means it's free for one uh, grid, and then you have to pay $59. Padlet is freemium, so you can use it for a little while, and it, if you want to add things to it, then that's another $59. Remind is free. It's been free for three years, so check all those out. So I don't know how many people in here I don't know how many people in here have, uh, see now I gotta get out of hers so I don't take the time to do this. Um, have a nursing programs? Anybody have nursing programs? Of course you do. Um, and how many people actually accept all the nurses into those programs that apply? <laughs> right, the aspiring nurses that we have, we, used to call, we call them aspiring nurses out of, uh, we take 80 or 90 out of the eight or 900 that apply. Um, but they all want to be in healthcare, so we've created this project uh, at Monroe, and I'm going to try to do it as fast as I can. Um, and they asked me, how can I put a game, <laughs> funny they asked me these things, how can I put a game inside of this project so that we can um, kind of get the nurses going to make a decision on what they want to be in the nursing field if it's not a nurse. If they don't get accepted in nursing, what else can they do? So they said, is there any way we could do that in Blackboard? I said, sure, we could do that in Blackboard, but why don't we do that as a mobile app? Why don't we put together a mobile app and make that happen? And they said, okay, but we really want to do something in mobile or in uh, Blackboard too. I was like, well, why don't we do both? So um, I took my old skills. I, st I still teach programming every once in a while. I took my programming skills, developed a new mobile app, um, and was able to find this little tool to take mobile apps. What is my password? Uh, it's going to be hard for me to do this quickly. Please let us in today. Don't save. Um, so what was created was the um, Monroe CC uh, Health Career Inventory, where the students actually go in. It's very similar to taking a, playing a game. Um, they go into the Health Career Inventory, and they, have, uh, they start it, and there's these little sliders that says things like, I, will, I don't have a problem touching patients, or I... Uh, I can deal with bodily fluids like blood, saliva, or feces, or vomit. All those kind of fun things. <laughs> this was my life for a few months. <laughs> <clears throat> so what they did was they created this uh, um, matrix, and I took that and I turned it into something. Please let me get in here before my time gets up. Um, but we couldn't do this. I couldn't, I couldn't demonstrate this, and I couldn't show this at presentations and all those things when I was trying to people understand it. So I found this company that allows us to do this. I'm really trying to get through here fast. Yes, this is a Monroe site. Um, so they created this whole course, and we're about to redesign it because it's not very well designed. Um, but this whole course includes this healthcare air interest inventory. And so what I did is I took that, I took the mobile app, and I mobilized it and created a Virtualized. So now, there we go. Now it's a simulator. Um, so this is what it really looks like. I couldn't show it to you on my phone, obviously, because I'm sitting in a room with 80 people. Um, but as people go through this, what happens is they are. Time? Three minutes. So if anybody wants to see that mobile app, I can show it on my phone later. <laughs> So, quick question here. Does anybody here know what a light board is? Is anybody in here using a light board? How's it working for you? Good, because that's what we're building right now up at uh, SUNY Poly. What we have going right now is we have some requests from faculty and from students who would like to have a way of enhancing lectures and projects, specifically when it comes to, say, difficult equations 
or physics problems. They need to have a way that it's illustrated a little bit better. And the number one complaint is everyone, when they're doing their lectures, are facing a whiteboard. They're facing away from the students. So by utilizing a light board in a small studio that we have set up, faculty can come in or students can even come in, do their problems, they're on the whiteboard, record them, and then post them for other people. Uh, for those of you who don't know what a light board is, I do have a link here. There it is. Mm. Oh, I can't find the. All right. So with the with the light board, uh, the way they generally work is you're in a dark room. You have lights that are shining through uh, glass. You're writing with fluorescent uh, colored uh, markers. And then just click. I developed this light board. Yeah, right there. So this is what a light board sort of looks like in action. And the way it works is though they are not actually trained actors to write backwards. Uh, the, the software that you use to edit this with uh, allows you to flip the light board image so that it looks like it's uh, normal to the uh, students who are viewing it. So it's a really nice way of getting your message across uh, without facing away from the students. It gives them much more of that personnel eye-to-eye -eye contact that you want with your students. So we've been uh, building the studio. We're utilizing Camtasia Studio as our editing software. It's pretty easy to use. Uh, we have both a Mac and a PC set up with a huddle cam that can be zoomed in and out. And then the light board will be coming online here by summer. Uh, we just haven't got it uh, purchased yet. But we've got our backgrounds ready to go and got a lot of interest in it. So that's what we're doing. I yield my eight seconds. <laughs> Hi everyone, Teresa Pittman, College North Atlantic. Uh, we're uh, the low okay. Good morning, everybody. College North Atlantic. Uh, I'm really happy to be invited here today. A little presentation tomorrow, if some of you can come. Um, that's my promo. Um, we use the SUNY tool, which Teresa is going to talk about, to do a readiness look at the uh, our college and our distributed learning services. So, Teresa. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'm Tricia Donovan. Um, very quickly, we um, adapted the Open SUNY Institutional Readiness Scorecard to guide a strategic review of distributed learning at College of the North Atlantic. They have witnessed 57% growth in their online enrollment in the last five years, but the, um, there are challenges that, are, that we're um, putting pressure on the system, and the, and the province and the government are asking them to continue to grow and expand. So we use the IRS scorecard process to do an analysis, guide a review. We interviewed a number of executives across the institution, deans, administrators, et cetera, that allowed us then to develop um, an assessment of where they are and what they need to do. And it, it effectively, it was a great tool for us. We modified it, um, but we were able, just modified the process. We didn't change the tool at all. Um, but what we were able to identify is that the growth in distance education had, and distributed learning had clearly outpaced the institutional processes required to support it. And so in the end, what we, what we developed was a strategic plan when the three, three strategic directions that talked about the need to build institutional commitment, capacity around faculty, administrators, within the institutions and to set up a student success framework. And, and we also followed the process um, from, from the IRS process to develop a scorecard, sorry, uh, to develop an action plan against a scorecard. So against all the 75 indicators, we were able to identify that 49 of the indicators, they were seen as accomplished. So there was some, um, so there was some evidence that could be substantiated of meeting the quality standard, but there was some room for improvement. There were a number, of, a number of other areas where we identified there's a bit more work required. So we completed a full action plan following the process that, um, that Alex provided. And so we now have an action plan against each of the 75 quality indicators that will help guide the operations for the institution so that they can grow and expand as they're under pressure to do. Thank you. Is this on? Can everybody hear me? 
So my name is Ian August. I'm formerly from SUNY. Now I'm working for St. John's University, and I have uh, uh, nothing new to report. Thank you. <laughs> Just kidding. So uh, we're working on uh, accessibility on our campus. We're making a big push to make everything accessible. We use Panopto as our tool to close caption video. Um, we're developing self-paced online faculty development modules using Articulate because we have a lot of faculty on campus, so we're trying to scale up our faculty development opportunities. We're having our first teaching symposium on campus. We've had a lot of tech days and tech focused um, big events, one day events on campus, but I think this is the first time we're having a, a teaching event and there might be some people in the room that are gonna be there. Um, so when I worked for SUNY, I was kind of department of one and I did like one off course development. So we're doing at St. John's a lot of program developments, moving whole programs online. So that's, uh, that's definitely fun and new. And the last thing is uh, I am leading a faculty development badging initiative to badge uh, faculty development, to badge our workshops, to badge our online course developments, self-paced and facilitated. And uh, I kind of have an idea maybe to badge along the, um, what is it called, Quality Matters Scorecard because, you know, that is the, the Bible we use for quality online courses and maybe kind of recognize faculty who are meeting those standards in an a intermediate, a novice, and an advanced way. It's just one of the ideas we have. Thank you. Hey there. Okay, so I got voluntold I should do this, which is great. Um, let's see if this works. I am recycling a, a presentation. Um, gosh, eh, nope, okay, never mind. Uh, I will make sure that that link works later, but basically I just wanted to give an update really quickly on the how we're doing with OER as a system um, this year. You know, we got a very generous $4 million to work with as a system to implement and expand OER programs. Thanks to many of the people in this room and watching online, we are going crazy in, in a good way. Um, so I want to say we've got over 56,000 students that we know of right now that are going to take an OER course this year, this academic year, which is amazing. Um, and we can report over six and a half million dollars of student cost savings in textbooks this year. Um, so I think we're doing pretty well with the four million dollars that we've gotten and we hope to be able to show even more um, numbers as we keep getting the numbers reporting in across the year. Um, we've got a bunch of workshops happening this spring. Um, a couple have already happened at Delhi Old Westbury. We've got several more open NYS, open-nys.org, find all of the cool stuff going on. We really encourage everybody to attend. Um, other good things that I should highlight. Um, we will have a community course um, very similar to the Interested in Online Learning course. Um, we're developing an Interested in OER kind of course and some deeper level pathways. More about that will be coming out um, in the next couple of months. Congratulations, everybody. You guys are rocking the OER thing. <laughs> Do we have time for a question real quick? Can I just have one question? Sure. Do you have any sort of um, database of what people are doing with the money that we got? We're working on that. We okay. will soon. Okay. Um, I can tell you informally if you want to shoot. Questions. I would love that. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Vicki? So if, I, if this is like a recruiting thing that I'm doing here, it's, I'm not stepping on anyone's toes. So um, Wind Energy Tech has a lot of hands-on uh, work, lots of skills that have to be um, observed and tested. And uh, things like you're at the top of a tower and the partner that you're working with gets stung by a bee and goes into anaphylactic shock. What do you do? How do you get them down off the tower? How do you... So these are things that I've been learning about, like, wow. And they have to actually go up the towers and practice this. First of all, just climbing the tower is a big step. So um, it's very difficult to do a fully, excuse me, fully online class. It's wind. 
um, uh, <laughs> class uh, degree program without having students come to campus to practice these very important skills to learn them and practice them. So, um, but if you want to be a wind energy technician, you have to go to one of the three schools um, uh, uh, east of the Mississippi, of which we are one. So eventually you're going to have to move to one of those schools, most people will. But what we've decided to do is to put the first semester of our wind energy tech program fully online so that people can experience the first uh, stages of the degree and then make the decision to move to beautiful Plattsburgh and take classes on the bluff of Lake Champlain. So uh, if you have any students who are interested in that, as I said, this is a recruitment uh, ad for um, our, our campus, but that's what we've, um, I had to work with a number of different uh, departments that had not had any courses online yet, so it was a very good experience and we're ready to go. Thank you. I'm Ann Reed, and I'm Director of Micro-Credentials and Digital Badges at the University of Buffalo. I just wanted to give a quick update on our initiative, which is a new initiative. Basically, um, it's only been going for, um, well, we had a committee that was looking into it for about a year, and then I was hired on in October. So we're looking to launch a, a broad array of micro-credentials and digital badges at the university, and I have our web page here that shows the sort, sort of four different types that we're going to be um, offering. Academic, meaning basically path to degree, unbundling a degree program, um, some courses that students can take um, that could motivate them through their degree or potentially they can come to the university just for the micro-credential and ideally stay for the degree program. Um, enhancement is our sort of co-curricular, not non-for-credit badges to recognize um, things that students are doing and learning at the university that would sort of, you know, re you know traditionally go unrecognized. And um, post-traditional is the space for uh, continuing education, professional development type of um, digital badges. And then emergent is the sort of innovative experimental space that might cross multiple um, boundaries, so uh, so we're excited, and we uh, put out a request for proposal, proposals, and those proposals are due on Monday, so we'll know in a couple of weeks what programs we'll be launching for the fall. So that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I want to kind of show it. Oh, well, Alex is uh, trying to find find a link to to the Google Doc there. I'm Mike Walker. I'm the Open SUNY Help Desk Manager. Um, I wanted to kind of quickly we support 37 out of the 64 campuses when it comes to actual help desk support services for the Blackboard LMS. Um, we have a knowledge base actually. If you, you, you look at the link, and um, we've been put put that up on the Commons back in March of 20. 17. Prior to that, we had it on our Confluence Wiki. Um, that one we kind of moved away from because it was more angel-based, although there was Blackboard documents. I wanted to make sure for those campuses that we don't support that it is an open, open-ended source for people to use. It's a small supplement to like the help.blackboard.com. Um, we also have uh, some basic te technical uh, articles that we put in. Um, we utilize it just as a, a supplement also to when we're dealing with students and faculty. Um, we also request, uh, now that she has it up and stuff, so for example, if you go to, over to like the technical support, one of the ones I wanted to show people is we do have a suggest an article um, type of format form. So if you find anything that, like if we're not posting something that you think that we should, uh, feel free to kind of suggest that you're utilizing that form. Um, and again, if there's any other things that you might need or suggest or you don't, you know, actually use our services but um, would like to learn a little bit more about the Open SUNY Help Desk, feel free to contact me. Thank you.
Since Alex put my, put my name on the list, I thought I'd come up and talk. Um, I'm uh, uh, Justin Lauder, Associate Vice Provost for eLearning at Texas Tech University, but also the, the chair of the Newton Board. Um, and one of the benefits that uh, SUNY has as an institutional or, or uh, a system-wide member of Newton is access to the webinars and, and free events that Newton puts on uh, throughout the year. Um, so in uh, May, um, let's see, I think it's... There it is. So in, uh, in May, uh, on May 10th, uh, Texas Tech University will be offering a, a, a webinar on uh, making documents accessible. Um, and it's a step-by-step -step webinar. Uh, and it's free and open to anybody. Um, so it'll talk you through how to make your syllabus accessible, how to make PDFs accessible, and PowerPoints um, accessible to students utilizing screen readers. Um, so that's from 2 to 4 Central. Um, on uh, on May 10th, and there's a, a sign-up link. It's it's a quick Qualtrics uh, uh, document. You just put uh, name, institution, email address in there, and and you're welcome to come to Texas Tech, but uh, for the face-to-face -face one. But there's an option for the online version, so so be sure to sign up on that. Uh, Newton will be offering a, a couple other webinars throughout the spring. Uh, there'll be uh, one in April, uh, one in June. Um, uh, and one in July, uh, but right now we don't have topics um, and dates for those yet. One will be offered by uh, Barnes & Noble Loud Cloud, talking about some of the work they've been doing, um, and a couple of other uh, members and, and board members will be offering sessions later on. So I welcome you to join us for that and look at the Newton website for upcoming events uh, for more information. Thanks. Lilia, you're next. Lilia, you're next. So, um, I've been involved with research about authentic assessments that take roots from my dissertation. So along that line, uh, I've initiated an IITG application for an OSCAR course review and the integration of authentic assessments in online courses. So please help me cross my fingers and hopefully we'll get an approval. Now incidentally, I'm, my paper research was also approved and will be included in the proceedings of the Association of the Advancement of Computing and Education in Netherlands in June. So I'm very excited about that. So all of these are helping me with my research and advocacy with Rockland Community College in pushing the use of authentic, non-traditional, authentic-based learning and assessment activities. Thank you. Since we had some conversation this morning about the scholarship for teaching and learning, I thought this would be worthwhile to share briefly. I know that Aaron has done a great job in helping us in promoting this out already through SUNY Workplace, but for those of you who are our guests today who are not with SUNY have not seen this, uh, our Center for Learning and Teaching and Learning has created a series of podcasts that we call Tea for Teaching, uh, facilitated by John Kane also of our fact to council and Rebecca Mushter, who is our associate director of our CELT Center. Uh, it's an opportunity really to highlight various research issues that are happening out there within SUNY and without SUNY. We've heard from Cornell, we've heard from uh, a scholar outside in terms of looking at attention span in the classroom. There's really been some interesting discussions. Uh, it's available through iTunes, it's available through your favorite uh, podcasting app. You can listen to it directly on the web. This week, uh, Chris, Chris, are you in the room? Or did Chris wander off? Well, this week, anyway, you get, there he is. This week, we get to listen to Chris Price talk about what's happening in faculty development. Um, the previous episode was some guy named Ketchum, so now you know why I'm talking about it. But uh, what's really fun is the fact that each show is actually annotated. So as we talk about these things, we go back and we actually annotate and provide the links out so that you can refer to those sources that we're talking about. So uh, check it out. We'd love to have you experience it. Thanks. Camille, Camille, you're up. Hi. 
Hi, I'm Camille from Farmingdale State uh, College. I'm just going to read a list of the things that we've been working on. Uh, right now, we're piloting an embedded librarian within our learning management system and within our online courses. So if a faculty member is doing a uh, needs an annotative bibliography or a refresher on plagiarism, that uh, library as an, uh, librarian as an expert will uh, be uh, moderating a discussion board forum, and so we'll be working that out. We are aligning, aligning, aligning. And so Tanya spoke this morning about um, aligning the measurable outcomes along with the technologies, the assessments, and the activities. We're working very strongly in that direction, and also timing the development of an online course. So Tanya, again, you spoke this morning about faculty members coming in a weekend before the course is scheduled and trying to build a course, and we are piloting now, um, setting up benchmarks, and we're going to see how, the, how that's going. Um, we have a memorandum of understanding with our campus help, uh, campus mental health services so that they're able to provide the same level of support to our campus-based students as um, online students would also um, uh, be needing, and so um, that, that's, uh, again, work, uh, work in progress. Um, we have rolled out our OER, so uh, that's uh, going forward, and so we're very excited about that. Um, and we also are looking forward to our Q2 um, update so that we can be rolling out Blackboard Alley for accessibility. So we have multiple things going in multiple directions, and um, it's all really good stuff. Hello, uh, my name is Deborah Spiro from Nassau Community College. Um, I will put up a link. I apologize, I'm having multiple tech challenges today. But in any case, um, I'll talk to you about EasySoft, and it is spelled correctly. It's two E's, EasySoft Reports and Messaging, a new platform we're piloting in our school. And um, in a nutshell, it, the reports piece the messaging piece, excuse me, allows you to create a proactive messaging tool within the LMS. So you can reach out to your faculty and even and to students and give them messages about items that they need to know about within the LMS, whether it's an urgent message or proactive messaging that you want to alert them to something or some kind of new tool that you're using. And they don't have to leave the LMS. So, that's the first aspect. The next part of messaging is you can create your own repository of help support. So you can take Blackboard information and couple that with your own documentation and create your own knowledge center within the LMS. The other aspect to it, which we haven't even gotten to yet, is analytics. It has a whole separate analytics piece. So as we go into this, we're learning more and more about the potential of this tool. The vendor's wonderful, and how I got to them, believe it or not, was through an email, and I said, this sounded interesting, let's give it a shot. So um, I will put up more information. You can take a look, and you can reach out to us as we pilot it. Last but not least, Mark. <laughs> Thank you, Willow. Uh, and, uh, and I just wanted to get up because there's a nor'easter coming. So you know, if everybody could sing with me, the legend lives on from the. Ch um, so um, the library, uh, the library system is changing within SUNY. We've started migration activities, so we're going to go into a new library services platform. So if you notice your librarians may be uh, a little more skittish than usual, um, it's because their workflows are dramatically changing and the environment is really radically going to change. It's going to be a better learning environment for the students and a better discovery environment as well. Um, also, one thing Alexis didn't mention is that we have a shared OER conference March 23rd at CUNY. Uh, where CUNY and SUNY faculty will actually share their, uh, their, their experiences teaching with OER this year. Uh, it's going to be a good, um, it's going to be a good day. There's going to be a lot of discussions around open pedagogy. We're really excited to hear Jesse later on today. Um, and then another thing is Tanya mentioned the quick framework. You should know that the, uh, the vendor subcommittee of the quick framework executive committee will be at CIT. 
Um, they're going to do a focus group interviews with vendors about the quick framework and also they're going to try to get as much face time as they can with some of the directors of online learning to kind of make you aware of the potential of the quick framework. It's really a great tool. I think it could help us with a lot of our procurement activities. Um, so it would be good if all of you could, uh, could attend their sessions and get to know them. And Willow, I'm out. <laughs> But we had built in some um, uh, some space today, uh, so I'm not too worried about it. I'm sure everybody's ready for lunch, which is ready for us outside here uh, to the left. Um, we will have an hour from now, which the time is um, uh, it's just about 12. So um, we'll uh, sorry, just about one. Yeah. So, I'm sorry. I, I sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we will start up again. Um, um, should we do two? Would that be, or, or ten of two? Two o'clock. It makes it easy. Two o'clock, we'll come back here. Um, f and um, the presentation at two will be Jesse Stommel. So, um, so please don't go too far. Um, and uh, enjoy the lunch. And for the virtual folks, we're coming back at two o'clock. All right. Thanks, everybody. Oh, this document is going to be available, uh, so if you want to continue yeah. to add to it, um, um, but it'll be continually available to you. Thank you.